burn orange. Like it? Oh, he gave me a this. He gave me this. <laughs> this, Bob. There you go. Um, who else do we have here? I see John. Wesley Marshall. Good God. I was just talking about helium on my last uh, Zoom two hours ago. And uh, Michael Lee, the uh, notable Michael Lee, uh, Michael's actually a partner of mine in a, in a new deal. I'm very excited about that. Very, very excited. Um, now he tells me what to do. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Um, Greg, I'm just saying hello to everybody. See what I'm doing? I'm establishing a pre-existing relationship with every one of you on, on um, I was gonna say Facebook, on Zoom. We got John Montero. Uh, John hasn't changed his moderator sign. That's pretty funny from the <laughs> call I was just on. Um, just saying hello to everybody. Mary, uh, whoever Dell user is. I think we must have uh, Brian Dell on. I don't know. Um, all right, so we're gonna start in just a minute on a topic that no one really wants to talk about. There are the riddles. How you guys doing? Sorry I missed you guys at last uh, mastermind. It's been awkward times. Um, the John Montero, there we go. Hey, John, change your moderator. You're not moderating mine. You're not <laughs> moderating this. Um, I just called Robbie. Hopefully he's on the phone with me right now. Oh, and everybody, there's Kevin. Kevin, say hello. Jeff, can you unmute Kevin for a second? Kevin Brenner. All right. Hey, what's going hey. on, guys? Hey, Kevin, hey, Meryl, how's, good to see you. how's the weather up there? It was gorgeous today. I uh, was stuck inside the five-sided circus, though. So what is the forecast? For, what is the forecast for tomorrow? Beautiful in DC. Okay, so it's not really working. Kevin is actually a weather person <laughs> for the <laughs> Army, Air Force, Air, Air Force. Force. Well, Sorry. both actually. I support yeah. both and the Marine Corps. Yep, yeah, so it's a blast. This is what happens when you ask a weather person what the weather's like. Oh, it was pretty good outside today. Um, but right. Kevin is an up and coming uh, young star. He's what we affectionately refer to in this group as a millennial. And right. um, I guess I've been mentoring you, if that's what you want to call it, or, or telling you to stop doing things. Um, but Kevin is stop overcomplicating is usually your number one advice to me. So, yeah. yes, that is mentorship in my book. Yeah. I'm trying to keep <laughs> With the KISS method. But Kevin's an interesting guy because he is um, putting together a group of uh, millennial investors. I know that's an oxymoron to most of us over the age of 45, but Kevin assures me there are millennials with money that either have jobs or had jobs at one point in their very short lives. But there is a, um, there is a very uh, interesting group out there. They market to each other differently. They speak a different language, which I'm still trying to figure out. But uh, Kevin and his partners have a pretty cool concept. Um, uh, they're about to launch a fund in the next uh, 45, 60 days. Uh, that's kind of a millennial investor-based fund. My gut tells me Kevin won't exclude old people out of it, but their target audience is millennials. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely fair to say. Uh, our our vision is uh, wealth creation for the millennial generation. So we are all about the millennial mindset and marketing directly to them and uh, using social media to generate leads and uh, and go from there. So cool. we're, we got the syndicators lined up. Now it's just getting the investors lined up. So it's going to be awesome. exciting. So thanks, Kevin. Um, Jeff, you can appreciate thank it. You. Kevin, thank you. Um, this this Zoomcast is brought to you by Kevin Brenner, who has graciously donated $1,500 to the Calcer and Associates Law Firm. Um, <laughs> just kidding. All right, you guys ready? I think everybody's in that needs to come in right now. I am going to share my screen. I um, should be pretty good at this by now. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. All right. I'll put it on presentation mode. All right. So um, this is pretty funny. So this is brought to you by Rob, who seemed to think that I was doing a Clint Eastwood show uh, for this. Um, so any likeness of Clint Eastwood is not, um, it is what? It's, um, it, it has not been approved by Clint Eastwood. So this has nothing to do with Clint Eastwood. This is Merrill East. This is Merrill Westwood. Okay. So anyway, uh, you know me, I tried to joke around a little bit. So I'm going to tell you ahead of time, it says 6 to 6.50 p.m. 
Um, I'm going to probably stay on to about 650. Uh, you guys are going to have questions. You'll have time to ask any type of legal question you want. Greg and Cindy, who are much smarter and better looking than me, are going to be on and answer those questions. So um, again, they'll interrupt me if there are any questions that people have pertaining to this. I'm going to warn you, um, this goes against everything I've told everybody not to do when raising capital, but it's out there now. And the SEC has said it's going to be a rule subject to some changes and comments that are going to be made over the next, I guess, 55 days now. So I figured I would go over kind of what's out there, what it's being proposed you can and can't do, assuming no government shutdown, assuming no strangeness that happens between now and January, February, and quite honestly, there's no guarantee of any of that. But assuming that, I would expect this rule to be passed sometime between February and March of next year. So this could be a game changer. It could also be very bad for us. See, a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, so they basically, the SEC breaks this down to six categories. Who can do it? What type of investors? What the issuer, which is the syndicator, can or can't do? What role can this, uh, I call, let's just call them a, a bird dogger, because that's really what they are, finder fees for a bird dogger. For those of you not from Texas, a bird dogger has nothing to do with a dog. It's someone that just goes and basically finds uh, those deals or finds those people that you couldn't otherwise find. Um, and then permitted activities and other terms of exemption. So I'm going to jump right into this. Okay, so the SEC divides these potential bird doggers, or they call them capital finders, between tier one and tier two capital finders. So when looking at this, you can look at it from two different perspectives. One is the syndicator, okay? I wanna go raise capital and I don't think I can do it by myself, but I don't wanna bring a general partner in who's gonna take up a bunch of the, the equity on the, um, on the splits and also have managerial duties. So I can't use a broker dealer because quite honestly, broker and dealers don't really care about deals that are raising under $50 million. They just don't. It's too much time. They have investors that are typically going to be in for anywhere from two to a hundred million dollars. And they don't want to be along investors with uh, 50, 100, 150 grand uh, as neighbors in their deals. So you can look at it from one, I'm the syndicator. And is this going to be helpful? And two, I'm the bird dogger. You know, I've got some resources, I've got some capital and hey, here's a way I can do it legally. I might not have been doing it legally, but I certainly didn't get that advice from Calcer and Associates, but now there's a way I can do it legally. So the SEC divides this up into two types of bird doggers, tier one and tier two. Tier one, um, when it says fr friends and one-offs, those are the people um, typically that uh, uh, they utilize for capital. Um, tier two, which is probably where people may tend to actually form more of a business out of, and this is where I see it having the most effect, is a professional capital finder. Um, it's someone that can participate in more than one capital raise within a 12-month period. So if you are just kind of a friends and one-off, and there's a whole chart that I'm going to give you guys at the end, we're going to send you guys a copy of the PowerPoint that has the chart. I just broke down the chart into nice categories. But bottom line, if you're a tier one capital finder, as the rule is currently written, you can only do this one time a year. Okay, so you're only allowed to raise capital one time a year. Not raise, but bring capital to a syndicator once a year. Okay. If you're not a tier one, you have more requirements because you're considered a professional finder, but um, you uh, can participate obviously in more than one capital raise per year. So I know this is gonna stem a lot of questions and we're happy to answer them to the best I can. Most of them are gonna be answers that start with depends, not the diaper, but the, the uh, uh, question. Merrill, you're muted. There we go. Jeff, you there? Okay. All right, some reason someone muted me. Um, so it's going to depend. So let's go to the next slide. Got that picture. Um, <laughs> who can be a cap? Who can be a tier one or tier two capital finder? Okay, so here's the here's the kicker. 
you have to be a natural person. Uh, I don't know what an unnatural person is, but you have to be a natural person. A he, him, she, it, others, undecided, maybe decided, whatever you want to call it. You can't be an entity, okay? Um, you can't have an LLC. You can't have an LP. You can't have an ink. It has to be a natural person. This is as it's written today right now. This could change. Um, but as it's written today right now, and you can't be a natural person that has any association with a broker dealer. Again, this whole deal is, and I see Kevin nodding his head because I kept saying, Kevin, you should wait and listen to what I'm about to talk about. Um, this, whole, this whole deal is to get around the broker dealer issue because broker dealers aren't going out and seeking capital for smaller capital raises like ours. When I say small raise, a million to 35, 40 million. There's a small raise when it comes to broker dealer. So the people that are commenting the most on this, it's going to shock you, are broker dealers. They don't even want natural people to go in and do this because they didn't have to go through the licensing. They're taking potentially money away when they hit the $35, $40 million syndications. So key point, don't go form an LLC next year at the beginning of the year to become a uh, professional capital finder or bird dogger, okay? Investors. Okay, so this is what type of investors can you bring in as a bird dogger? Okay, so what type of investors can a tier one, tier two capital finder solicit from? You cannot solicit from sophisticated investors. That should be obvious to you, but sophisticated investors are not accredited and they're held to a lower degree of knowledge as it, as it pertains to investors. So to have someone who's not even in the deal getting paid to bring people in, um, you know, that makes it even. You're muted again, Meryl. That makes it even more at risk for um, uh, sophisticated investors. So has to be an accredited investor, okay? How do you determine if they are accredited? We don't know yet. My gut tells me that the determination of who is accredited is still based upon the syndicator, okay? The syndicator, if it's a 506, we're gonna to get to this, a 506B or a 506C, it's a 506C, it's up to the syndicator to prove their credit. If it's a 506B, it's up to that individual. So I, as the rule is currently written, it does not put the burden of determining if the investor is accredited on the, on the, on the uh, capital finder. But I can tell you what, if you come to somebody just got a dirt. If you come to somebody, if you if you come to somebody and you ask, um, hey, listen, hey, Cindy, I'm going to bring in five hundred thousand dollars. I've got five one hundred thousand dollar credit investors, and Cindy's doing a five hundred six C, and she runs them, and only one out of the five are accredited. Do you think Cindy number one is ever going to use you, and do you think number two is Cindy's going to pay you? Okay, so there, there's a whole lot of of, of things to think about at the end of this, this uh, uh, Zoom call, but I want you guys to see what's going on because this will greatly impact all of us on here that are doing syndication. So how do you determine if they're accredited? My gut tells me that it's gonna be, the burden is gonna be on the investor themselves and or the syndicator uh, if he or she is doing a 506C. Um, so that goes back down to the burden. It could change. I think it should be the burden should be quite honestly on the capital finder. They're getting, they're probably going to get a hefty fee. And so we should be more than just a handshake. If they're bringing capital into a deal, they should make sure that capital can actually be in the deal in the first place. That's just my opinion. So now the issuer, um, and this is basically just as a syndicator who can take advantage of fact finder uh, fact finders as capital finders. Went into litigation mode for a second. So who can take uh, advantage of capital finders? It's obvious. I put it in here anyway, because it's in the chart. It's for people doing private uh, placements, private raises, everything we're doing. If we were going public, we couldn't use them. And quite honestly, if you're going public, you're going to use a broker dealer um, or an RA. So this is kind of a given, but it's in the chart. So I went ahead and left it. Now the offering, all right. So you guys, an offering is a PPM. PPM, which includes the company agreement, subscription agreement. You guys understand what an offering is. So these, uh, these are what we call proposed safe harbors for the fact, fact finder, for the capital finder. I keep saying fact finder. For the capital finder, for the bird dogger. 
Okay, so again, these are these are limited to exempt offerings, 506B, 506C, a couple other exemptions under um, Reg D, but most everybody here is doing 506Bs uh, or Cs. No IPOs, no reverse IPOs, um, no conversions. So again, you have to be doing, for practical purposes of this call, a 506B or a 506C to even utilize a bird dogger and pay that person a fee. Permitted activities, okay. So a tier one investor, which is the easiest, a tier one capital raiser, which is the easiest capital raiser slash bird dogger there is, again, you're only allowed to provide investor, well, I'm sorry, again, you're only allowed to do this once every 12 months. I wanna emphasize that. So that's a, in my mind, that's a one and done deal, okay? You're helping out a buddy, you're friends with someone raising capital and you got a couple friends who are credit investors that wanna put in 3 million and you're gonna make a quick uh, 90 grand off of that. Yeah, I'm saying 3%, whatever the number is, you're gonna make 90 grand, you might be able to do it under this scenario. Now, this is all you can do as a tier one investor, uh, capital finder. You're allowed to provide the investor, investor's contact information to the issuer. That's it. So, hey, Kevin, Greg, um, he's at 123 Main Street. His email is this, his phone number is this. He has a million dollars that he wants to put with you. That's it. That's all you can do. You cannot get involved in the deal. I see uh, uh, Kevin's giving me a thumbs up. Well, how does Kevin know he's going to get paid on that? How does Kevin know if I ever talked to Greg or talk to the person that was, how does Kevin know if Greg ever talked to me if I'm the, the potential investor? There are ways to fix that, but two things. Number one, very, very little has to be done, but you're only allowed to do that in one investment. So you can bring 25 people and 25 million and charge 3% walk away with 750 grand, you know, that's great. That's a nice uh, one day's worth of work. Uh, the likelihood of that happening is probably slim to none. Um, but basically all you can do is provide the contact information to the syndicator and then you're out of the deal. Personally, if I'm a capital finder, I would not like that because I've lost all control over my potential, uh, I would say my investor from my group. And so I'd want to be more involved in the transaction. And I'd also want to show more value to the syndicator and to the investor I'm bringing in, because why would a syndicator pay you 3% for a name and a phone number? You know, that's a much harder conversion than, than you sitting with the bird dogger, if you can, and talking to the investor at the same time about the deal, uh, you're going to have a much better success rate and the investor is going to feel a lot more comfortable about doing the deal. So that, those are permitted activities. It's really activity. The tier one can only just provide investor contact information. Now, tier two, this is the professional uh, capital finder, okay? So the professional capital finder is allowed to provide investor contact information to the issuer, just like a tier one. They also can identify, screen, and contact potential investors that they don't already know, but believe are gonna be accredited investors. They can distribute offering materials to investors. Guys and gals, very important because it didn't say they could do that as a tier one. This is a legal issue. You can't do it as a tier one. So I cannot provide them a pitch deck, a one pager, anything about offering materials, anything regarding offering materials to the investors. My gut tells me I can probably give them a very, very high level discussion about what the deal is and then okay you know uh greg here is kevin brenner's phone number name email address i'm told he's interested in putting a million dollars in good luck cut me a check when he pays that's it okay one time so you can distribute offering materials to the investor which is nice gives you a chance to discuss you can discuss the syndicator's information in offering materials so again because it says you can discuss the information in the offering materials, it doesn't say that as a tier one. So I might argue that you can't discuss the specifics in offering materials if you're a tier one capital finder. So bottom line is, I don't think anybody is going to wanna to be a tier one capital finder because it's gonna be very hard to get someone to actually put money in someone else's deal with you being completely out of the deal and not giving them a whole lot of information about the deal. 
but you could be special. Um, so you can discuss the syndicator's information and offering materials, and you can arrange and or participate in meetings with the syndicator and the investor. To me, I think this is key if you want to go and become a professional tier two, I would just call them capital raisers. You know, you are going to want to be at the meetings. You are going to want to make sure that it was you who brought the deal to them. You want to be very professional. You want to have already pre-negotiated a deal, a contract with the syndicator as to what comes in. Um, and we'll talk about that in a couple minutes if I, yeah, we, I'm running, I'm running good time right now. Um, so this is very important. Um, there are parts of this that even myself as a lawyer like. Um, I do like it being a little bit ambiguous here because it provides some, some wiggle room, but my gut tells me when it's finally published and approved um, after the comment section, it'll be a little more tied down. There'll be other lawyers and most likely broker dealers that are commenting on this. Okay, so here's where it starts to get a little interesting and makes it a little more difficult. There's a burden to enter into this. So what is an impermissible activity? So we had what was permissible and I made the argument because it's not permissible, it could be impermissible, okay? Or not permissible. Um, this actually has in their rule, which is, I think it's like 38 pages, uh, the order is 38 pages long. Um, this actually lists specific activities that you cannot you cannot invest for or you cannot do as a tier one or tier two capital raiser. So you cannot have any involvement in structuring or participating in the transaction or the offering terms, okay? So what that means is if you're gonna go and, and look for a bird dogger as a syndicator, you do it after you've already structured the deal. They don't want a bird dogger coming to you before you've structured the deal and that bird doggers investors are influencing the way the deal is going to be structured. That is not what they, that is not what the SEC is, is looking for in this. So again, you have zero involvement in the participation or structure of the transaction or the offering terms. Okay. Now as a syndicator, that's fine. But if I don't think I can raise enough capital on my own for a large deal, I'm going to reach out to Cindy and to Tandy and I'm going to say, Tandy's sleeping. There she is. <laughs> uh, Cindy and Tandy, and I'm going to say, hey, listen, ladies, um, I'm going to pay you guys each 4% for all the capital you can bring me on this deal. Um, haven't figured it out yet, but I want you guys to start thinking about that. I'm going to have my structure and transaction, uh, my uh, offering terms done in the next two weeks with a PPM. That's fine. But I can't say, hey, Cindy and Tandy, tell me, the investors that you can get into my deal? Are they looking for an 80-20 split, a 90-10 split, 8% cash on cash? They like waterfall structures. Do they want just a 10% coupon and nothing at the end, just their money back? You tell me so I can structure the deal. That's probably going to get you in big trouble with the SEC. Um, you cannot handle funds or securities as a capital to uh, capital raiser. So, so Greg cannot give me a $250,000 check to give to Cindy's syndication. Greg has to move the money directly to Cindy and vice versa. I shouldn't be involved in any of the documents um, that reflect securities like a um, subscription agreement or anything like that. That needs to be done between the issuer or the issuer's team and the prospective investor. Um, I cannot perform an independent analysis of the transaction and then tell the, the prospective investor, hey, I'm a bird dogger. I'm a professional bird dogger. Okay. I'm a PBD. PBD. Yeah. I'm a PBD. Um, if it file that real quick before anybody else takes it, <laughs> I'm a PBD. I'm a professional bird dogger. Um, and so I've looked at this deal and I can tell you, I believe this is going to be a 9% cash on cash with a depreciation, accelerated depreciation expense of a bonus of uh, 90% on, on, uh, on the dollar year one. And I think in five years, you're going to get a 40% pop in capital gains. I can't do that. I've just violated the SEC rule. I do not think they're going to change that. That's what broker dealers can do. And they spend a lot of time and money going through classes and being educated and have insurance that protects them in that way. So you cannot give an opinion on whether the deal is a good deal, bad deal, whatever. 
don't perform an independent analysis on the deal. You cannot engage in any due diligence activities. So uh, uh, Kevin wants to bring a million dollars to Greg and Kevin says, hey, Merrill, can you run me a Yardy report on this particular property and tell me how it turns out? Um, this is so nice. My wife is coming in here feeding Rob, but not me. I, I don't, I, I no. So anyway, um, you have to be very careful that you do not get involved in due diligence activities. They don't want you being the syndicator. They don't want you influencing your prospective um, uh, uh, investor if you're bringing him or her to the syndicator. They want you participating in the discussions, you know, or not want you. They're allowing you to participate in discussions, but you can't give an analysis on it. You can't give an opinion, uh, opinion on it, and you can't do due diligence on it. Um, and they also talk about as an impermissible permissible activity, assisting or providing financing for investment purchases. Okay. It kind of goes without saying, but, um, I guess an example of this would be Kevin wants to put 250 grand into Tandy's deal. And I'm sorry, Kevin has an investor that wants to put 250 grand in Tandy's deal, but Kevin's investor only has 150. So Kevin says, hey, I know a guy, you know, that can uh, uh, loan you money, you know, for that extra hundred grand to put in the deal. That's going to be a no-no. Um, they really want Kevin to be the middle person between someone with money and someone who has a place to put the money, i.e. the syndicator. They really don't want Kevin giving advice. Sorry, Kevin, but you happen to be, I, I gave you a promo today, so you get picked on um, but they really don't want Kevin to give advice, financial advice, analysis, due diligence, any of that. He can give high level. He can give the, the offering docs, assuming he's a tier two capital finder. And he can bring that person, bring me directly to Tandy and say, okay, I want you to meet one of the GPs. Let her go over, you know, more specifically and ask questions. And I want to be there with you. Uh, to make sure you're getting everything answered in a timely manner. Okay. Um, again, we've talked about provide advice on the valuation or financial advisability of the investment. This is everything a broker dealer does or an RAA does. And so you can be, you can be well assured these were put in there because the broker dealer lobbies and the RA lobbyists uh, require the SEC to put it in there. You, you get a totally different, um, service when you go to a broker deal if you're a high net worth individual individual they don't just throw you ppms like like people do in our type of deals um the broker dealers will analyze the deals independently analyze the gps independently and provide you their analysis which would be like a four page teaser and then a 150 page document on why this is or isn't a good deal and why they should invest in it so they do not want you doing something like that um, and then at the bottom, I just reiterated, reiterated again, only tier two capital finders can do this more than once um, a year. Other terms of the exemption um, and a fraud protections, there are none. Um, so bottom line, if you're doing something fraudulently, not only can you get in trouble, your syndicator could get in trouble too. So be careful. Um, is there a written agreement with the insurer required? No. Okay. <laughs> and that's insured, issued. No. All right. It's not required. I'm going to go on record as saying every one of you that doesn't get a, a, an agreement is stupid. Okay. I'm not trying to be nasty. You're stupid if you don't have it in writing. Okay. If it's not in writing, you have a 30% chance of actually getting it at the end. All right. I'm going to go into some pros and cons in a minute, but I'm a little strong about that. Get it in writing, have a law firm, doesn't have to be ours, prefer if it is, doesn't have to be ours, draft up an agreement signed by both you and the syndicator stating if you bring in X, whatever the terms are, this is what you get. Um, are there written disclosures to investors required? Um, I'm sorry, X means yes. I'm sorry, I just flipped this around. Look at the card. has to be in writing, sorry. <laughs> I normally use a check mark and uh, I used X on this. I don't know why I used X. Has to be in writing. Column to the left is tier one, column to the right is tier two. Okay. 
So they have to be in writing. Anti-fraud protections apply. That's why I was saying you'd be stupid if it wasn't in writing. It has to be in writing. Written disclosure to investors required. Here's where it gets tricky. So written disclosure to investors means, okay, I'm not responsible. I don't have to do, I, you know, I make no blah, 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 no representations, just like your PPM is. Um, your PPM is typically 35 pages and 31 of them are, this could go bad. I'm indemnified. You can't sue me. This can go bad. Oh, and did I say this can go bad? Because it can go bad. All right. Under tier one, there's no written disclosure required to your potential investors as a fact finder. Um, that makes sense because typically it's going to be friends and family. They're accredited investors. You're providing no information. You're not even providing docs. You're just giving a name, email, and phone number to a syndicator saying this person might be interested in investing. However, as a tier two and as a professional, you're sending out most likely um, uh, the docs for the actual investment. You're talking at a high level about the actual investment. You're qualifying most likely the credit investor. And then you're going with the credit investor or at least participating on a Zoom call or some other call about the deal. So that investor, whether you like it or not, is relying on the fact finder to find him or her a good deal as much as the syndicators were lending on the fact finder to find him or her good investors. So there is a, a written disclosure required um, and no statutory disqualification. It's the same, uh, same issues as you have with um, regular people raising capital. You can't make any fraudulent statements. Um, anything you do that violates SEC can prevent you from ever doing this again. You're subjected to uh, fines, potentially prison, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see if there's anybody, anything else on here. Cons. Um, that's pretty funny. So cons, I didn't put any pros because we can talk about the pros. The pros are pretty much self-explanatory. Cons, okay. You guys need to focus on the cons. Remember, I'm Nancy negative on everything because I'm a former corporate bankruptcy lawyer. I see the worst. So cons, Kevin wants to go out and do this tomorrow. Kevin's going to call me tomorrow. And there's probably a 50% chance he does this and wants to know how he can be proactive and put together a, a professional, uh, uh, what I call it, a PDB? I don't even remember what it's called. But anyway, yeah, yeah. professional class two, uh, tier two uh, investor club, okay? And that's fine because this actually is pretty interesting, but he can't do an LLC. It's gotta be as an individual. Um, so he's gonna make sure, Kevin's going to make sure, nod your head, Kevin, that he has pre-qualified all of his accredited investors. Because if I'm a syndicator and Kevin brings me six investors, each with 100 or 200 grand, and I'm relying on it, and he's telling me they're accredited and they're not accredited, I'm going after Kevin. He just wasted, you know, five days of my life I can't get back. And Kevin will get a bad, bad rap and a bad reputation. He won't be able to do it again. So if you're wanting to do this, I highly, highly recommend that you spend the $55 or $59 per accredited investor and get them verified. Or make sure that your investor that you want to bring into deals um, has an affidavit from uh, the CPA that says they meet the requirements. This is where a law firm can come in and put together a package like we do for syndications and PPMs um, that basically is a tier two capital, you know, professional capital uh, racer package. And so we put disclaimers together. We put a whole bunch of things together. Yes, I'm seeing it as a way for us to make more money as a law firm. Um, however, it's also insurance for every one of you out there because this is going to be the wild, wild west. You're going to have every single broker dealer that gets wind of you raising capital from anybody with a significant net worth looking to find that you did something wrong. This is very harmful to broker dealers. Uh, I'm just telling you. So it's very good for small businesses. And it will be passed in a form most similar to this, but as it is right now. So there's a huge potential for abuse and fraud. Of course there is. Not having things in writing. Someone saying they're a tier two, a tier one, but they're really a tier two. You as a syndicator have no idea. Um, there's all sorts of things. Could they be giving a kickback to the actual investor? There's no talk of that here. I will guarantee you that's a huge red flag. So the investor says, Rob says to me, hey, I'm looking for a deal. I want to put half a million in. I'm going to give you, you know, $10,000. You can find it. But meanwhile, 
um, I'm going to Greg and I'm saying, Greg, I have half a million dollars. Greg's like, cool, I'm paying 5% to legit capital um, uh, finders that can find me half a million or more. So now I'm making money from both ends and I didn't disclose it. You might be able to get away with it if you disclose it, but if you disclose it, who really wants to pay you when they know you're already getting paid quite a bit of money? So that could be an issue. Um, for us syndicators out there, um, we're at risk with tier one and tier two capital finders not being compliant. Um, there's a serious risk of, of them being non-compliant and that liability transferring over to us because we're only gonna, we, I'm a syndicator as well, we're really only gonna find out when something bad happens. Investment doesn't go the way it's supposed to be. Some broker dealer gets butt hurt, whatever. That's the only time we're gonna find out about it and we actually may not know as a syndicator, you know, you need to do your own due diligence on these tier one and tier two capital finders. And that's something that Greg and I are already working on um, putting together because I anticipate this is going to get passed in January and February. And I also anticipate with all the dry powder that's out there, there are going to be some groups that want to take advantage of this. Now, they'll have to be individuals that do it. Um, I would try to figure out if you can get insurance uh, if you're able to get some e &O or just general liability insurance, I don't even know if it's going to be available for non-broker dealers that aren't licensed. So that's another thing you have to worry about. Um, because you're not licensed, I don't know if you're insurable. And so you kind of enter at your own risk or make sure all your assets are protected. Um, how does a syndicator truly determine if someone is tier one or tier two? How do you know? You have really no way of knowing other than you're assuming if Greg sends uh, Jeff an email and says, Kevin is coming in with a uh, million dollars and his email is 123howwecheatem.com and his phone number is 8675309. Okay. It's little, only a couple people figured that one out. Well, us old people, but his name's not Jenny Jenny. Um, but you know, if, if that's all he brings, then the argument should be he's a tier one capital finder. Okay. But if you come to find out that that uh, Jenny, Jenny already knows about the deal, has already seen the documents. Um, you got to be very careful. You got to be careful what they know, what they don't know, and what happened to uh, to to Greg who brought the deal. You know, is Greg still in the deal? So there's a lot of there's got to be some formalities that are set out, and this is probably going to be set out uh, more so uh, after they get the comments back, but. There's a huge difference between tier one, tier two. If you're gonna do this on your own, I would highly recommend you become a tier two. You make it professional. I can see how a, a, a final version of this might include an LLC. I can see that as a possibility, um, but it's not written there right now. And there'd have to be a huge push by the community that makes comments on these rules to really show that they need to be an LLC. I would like it only because it gives that person or person's protection, and they could also get liability insurance uh, much easier. Um, then you have the disclosure to potential investors that some of their funds could be used to pay for the tier one, tier two capital finder. That's the biggest kick. Um, and that goes to both the, the fact finder, the, the capital finder and the uh, syndicator. Both of you guys need to disclose to the investor that either the cap, both of you have to disclose that the capital finder is getting paid a fee. And so if you're bringing in $200,000 and the syndicator is paying 5%, your investment literally, if you look at it in a vacuum, the, the, the capital account for your investment, you know, it, the value dropped to 190,000. So you as a syndicator, you need to make up that difference. You know, if you want to hit those returns, you have to make up you know, $10,000 before you're technically making returns for that investor. So there's a cost to everything. So if you're doing a million dollar raise, and you're paying 5% to get your money, that's expensive. If you're doing a $20 million raise, you're paying 3% to get your money, and it's a lot less work, you know, that's probably easier to swallow. It's going to depend on how desperate people are. And people get very desperate when it gets time to close. Um, and then you're going to see the sharks that come out. Uh, and you'll see, I promise you, you will see people paying 10 to 15% at the last minute for money, which is so expensive. It's ridiculous.
Um, and then I'm gonna leave it with you know the final rule. Uh, nobody really knows what it looks like. And I have uh, these pretty people right here with our contact information, most of you know it. So I'm gonna not share screen and open it up for questions. How are we looking on time? It is 6.41. I'm good on time. So I'm gonna not share the screen and see if I can go back to, stop share, that helps. Go back to the big screen. All right. So, oh my God, Jeff Amos is on. Guys, we're in, we, we, we have awesomeness uh, uh, coming from California. Um, so Cindy, are you on? Yes. Do we have it. First of all, guys and gals, please, please put your contact information in the chat box. I don't copy it, but it's for each one of you guys to be able to network market, uh, reach out to each other. I miss the days of having a happy hour, um, because it was a lot of fun and I would always give 30 minutes, but with this COVID, um, I actually get to see people like uh, Jeff and Michael and Kevin and, and others who don't live in Dallas. So I want people to take advantage of it. It might be a way for you guys to do deals with each other, um, whatever, especially Ball. Ball looks tired right now. Ball, how you doing? Good. Okay, so who has questions? Cindy. Okay. Question number one, and you may have already answered this, but it says this means going through a tier one person, you can take money from people who you do not have an SEC compliant relationship with. No, because by the time this is approved, this will be an SEC compliant relationship. So the answer to that question is kind of, it's sneaky. Uh, so today, yeah, that is not SEC compliant, but tomorrow, not actually tomorrow, but let's call it Q1, sometime in Q1, a tier one and tier two that follow the requirements that will be codified at that time will be an SEC compliant relationship. They're basically creating two new categories besides broker dealers slash RIAs that can bring capital to syndicators. Licensing aside, how does a tier two differ from a traditional broker dealer responsibility? How do tier two differ from traditional broker dealers responsibilities? So again, we kind of talked about that in the PowerPoint, which uh, Roxy will distribute the PowerPoint and uh, copy the presentation to everybody uh, normally in the morning. Um, responsibilities, I don't know if the responsibilities quite honestly are that much are that different. The difference is though, and I've used, I've used broker dealers and they're hit and miss sometimes, depends on which ones you use. A broker dealer is typically going to have a lot more information, a lot more business knowledge and more training when it comes to describing the actual opportunity than a bird dogger. I'm just saying traditionally. And because of that, they are legally under the SEC's proposed rule allowed to give advice on the deal allowed to give their own due diligence on the deal and allowed to encourage them to do or not do that deal. So that licensing gives them a lot of power. And for those of you that truly understand broker dealers, I know John does, he and I have had discussions about, uh, about private equity groups and other similar groups. Um, your broker dealers are totally different than a bird dogger. A broker dealer is typically gonna, typically gonna be a broker that works for a dealer. Um, that they're typically gonna have 400, 500 family offices, uh, small funds, high net worth, high, high, ultra high net worth individuals. And they're already gonna know 15 or 20 people or entities that will fit this model, okay? And then they're gonna put together their own little prospectus or cheat sheet, send it out to them to see how many people are truly interested in the deal. And they're gonna move forward. As a bird dogger, number one, you're not going to be afforded the luxury of time. Um, our deals are typically you raise capital in 30, 45 days and you're off to the races. Um, broker dealers are brought in on IPOs, on companies, you know, uh, increasing, uh, uh, maybe not necessarily public, but uh, it's called private REITs um, that are raising $100 million, whatever. They're ongoing capital raises. They're not SPE, single purpose entities that are just doing one deal at a time. So if you have an open fund and you guys have heard me talk about open funds and 
you have large aspirations to do an open fund, ultimately raise 50 to $100 million, you know, establishing a broker dealer relationship, or quite honestly, establishing a tier two capital relationship, that might be beneficial if it's costing you, I keep saying 3%, the broker dealers we've talked to are between three and 5% um, that I've used. And you typically have some upfront costs that you pay for them. They are not cheap. Um, so you want to, you want to do your due diligence on a broker dealer, just like you were doing a due diligence on your co-partner or co GP, which most of you don't do, but I keep telling you, you should do, um, you want to, you want to make a list of the top 10. Am I get a smile from Michael? You want to make a list of the top 10 and you want to have a questionnaire that you guys all agree. This is the information we want to find. And then you discuss it uh, with your partners. And then you interview them like it's for a job um, because you're interviewing another spouse, a business spouse. And so you're going to be married to that person for three to five to seven years. So broker dealers typically look for long-term relationships. They don't like one and dones. They don't like raising capital for a one-off. They like raising capital for consistent uh, uh, deals. Um, so I can't see a very lucrative business for capital two, uh, for tier two capital uh, finders that follow the rules, that create a nice website that's going to be SEC compliant and that have very, very, very good and, and specific documents that don't deviate. It is a normal set of documents they use and they've already reached out to, let's say 20 different GPs they like and they're just kind of on standby. I can see it being a good business. I can also see many, many people I see on Facebook taking advantage of this and it being very bad, bad for the investor, bad for the syndicator. Um, and I would say bad for the tier two, but these are people that are probably already doing things they shouldn't be doing. So it's not going to have the same impact on them morally. But again, I would, I would strongly, I, I think it's something that people should look into. I know of people that have asked in the past and, you know, you can't do pay for play. This is pay for play. If Jeff raises $2 million, I'm going to pay him 4%. If he raises $1 million, I'm going to pay him 2%. I'm going to put it in writing. And I'm going to bring Jeff. I'm going to, and if Jeff brings me those people, and Jeff, you're more than welcome to. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but after the, after the SEC has passed the rule, um, I'm fine with that. You know what? If he brings that to me, Jeff is my best friend forever. Now, just like a broker dealer, I have to perform for Jeff the same way I perform for the investors he brought. So it's not just now, you know, I got to, I got to, like you do with your normal deals, you got to make sure that, hey, I told him I'm going to give him eight to 10% cash on cash. I need to be shooting eight to 10%. I also have to keep in mind that Jeff, and sorry, Jeff, I just, cause I see on the screen, Jeff is a good source of capital for me. So if I let down his investors, how likely is Jeff going to send me two or three more people next time? So and it, it, so it, it can create a very unique opportunity in kind of our social systems, um, uh, our social networks um, for people that, and there are people, they have access to capital, but they don't want to do deals. They don't want to be a syndicator. Um, they're just a broker. And there's nothing, it's like flipping houses. Some people like the buy and hold and some people like the uh, buy and flip. And there are great reasons for both. And I'm one of those guys that did both, but I don't necessarily need the fee up front. I like the long-term revenue. I say that, but uh, during COVID, I would have liked to have flipped a lot of houses if that was possible, because that would create instantaneous gratification for me. Um, so there are opportunities, quite honestly, uh, Jeff raises, Jeff and his brother raised 10 million for an $8 million deal and there's $2 million left over. And Jeff may say, hey, you know what, Merrill, I, our deals are similar to yours. I have $2 million that wanted to invest. I closed them out. I mentioned that you had an opportunity you might be able to get into and they did it. I'm saying that's if Jeff wanted to do that. He's nodding his head, so I'm excited about that. But if Jeff wanted to do that, you know, okay, Jeff, our agreement was I pay you 4%. So you're going to get 80 grand. Thank you so much for doing it. I'll take care of your investors. Um, so I can see that like in your lifestyles groups and sometimes in Sumrock groups where it's, it, there are not a lot of deals going on and it's just a flood of investors all attacking one deal. And, you know, 
don't turn them away, capture them, make some money off of it. If you can, I'm not trying to be greedy, but they trust you. And if you trust the person that you're sending them to, I, we send people to competition many times. Um, you know, it's just, it's another opportunity. Cindy, any more questions? Uh, yeah. What is the difference in requirements between tier two capital raiser versus a co-sponsor primarily raising capital? Okay. So a co-sponsor raising capital is going to be part of the GP. So that's a totally different thing. So this is a, I'm just going to raise capital and for lack of better words, you're never going to see me again. Um, I'm going to bring the money into you and then you're gone. Personally, I like this better. I, if I have to bring somebody in to bring in capital, sometimes, you know, I may not like bringing that person or what if that person doesn't um, jive well with my other two partners? We've all been in that situation. Um, so you really want the capital, but you know, you can't pay them for capital under the current rules. Um, so why give up a GP position? Now, there's a lot of reason why people want co-sponsors. Sometimes it's capital, sometimes it's banks, it's, uh, it's your financial net worth. There are a lot of different reasons. You may decide you want that uh, uh, tier two to be on your GP side. Well, then they're no longer a tier two capital person. They're GP, but you have to make sure you're not paying them in proportion to what they're raising. Here's the kicker. You can't pay a GP in proportion to what they raise, but the SEC is proposing you can pay a non-GP, non-co-sponsor in a proportion in proportion to what they raise. Um, it's no different than our whole world going upside down over the last six months. One and one equals three now. So who would have thought eight months ago that this would be something not only proposed, it's provisionally passed. Um, so it's it's a it's an interesting thing. I'm telling you guys, you should, if you're interested in doing it, you should start preparing for it. You could be the first few people that jump into the market. I'm not saying everybody needs to do it, but there is an opportunity for people to make good money. And especially if you're tier two and you have nice qualified um, GPs, you can come up with your own qualification system. You know, they fit the model. Um, I can easily, now you need to make sure you write this down. I can easily see uh, uh, a scenario where you could actually create a grading system and, you know, people come to Jeff Amos because Jeff has the best investors and very professional. We know what his agreements look like. Jeff actually listens on every Zoom call to make sure that the questions are answered, blah, blah, blah. And Jeff sends me, you know, Tiff's treats every time I get it, besides my three or 4% or I send Jeff, whatever. He sends me tip street, something stupid, but there clearly can be a niche for qualified people that are good people doing this. And there can be a huge amount of bad people doing it. My hope is the bad people don't overcome the good people because I do think this is a, a, a healthy way that could help many people on here raise capital outside their current ecosystems. Um, and that seems to be an issue with uh, many groups right now. I am going to have to run and jump to another uh, old capital with uh, Julie. If anybody's listening on and Julie's in California, um, I think it's like two o'clock in the afternoon there right now. Um, it's my bedtime here. I'm kidding, but I'm going to jump off. Cindy and Greg are happy to answer any additional questions. Um, and uh, I appreciate you guys uh, being on and look forward to the next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, you Well, Greg, is anyone staying on? Uh, <laughs> I think it we looks have... like there's a couple other questions. Yeah. Um, I, I saw one from Kevin. I hypothetically hire a tier two finder as an independent contractor to work for a fund to raise capital. To me, that's what a tier two finder would be. Um, they, would, they wouldn't be employees. They would be independent contractors always anyways. Um, so I'm not totally clear on that question. Let's go to the next one. Um, it was mentioned as syndicators, we wouldn't know if the capital raiser is a tier one or tier two, how will the SEC know and control this? That's a good question. Yeah, I don't think we know yet. Um, yeah. I think there, there's obviously still a lot of unknown with how this is going to play out. Um, but it doesn't, I don't know if, if 
if there's going to be, you know, simple notice filings required, sort of like a form D when you do a reg D type offering, um, you know, just based on my two cents, uh, if you plan on doing this at all, it, it seems safer to sort of consider, treat yourself as if you're a tier two than a tier one. Uh, it seems like uh, if there's any doubt, you should be sort of proceeding as though you're a tier two. Makes sense. Um, so we've been approached for years for the person that knows five doctors and they want a payment for that. So is this the way to encourage those people to participate? Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I've gotten that. It's funny that you mentioned doc, doctors, Jeff, because that always seems to come is always the, the profession that I always get asked about on that. It, somebody always knows a bunch of doctors that don't know how to invest and don't know who to contact, but uh, somebody always knows them and wants to bring them into a deal. Um, but yeah, I think this is, this would absolutely open the door for, for activities like that. Makes sense. Um, as a tier two, can you raise capital from asset man from asset managers slash funds? That's a good question. I, I don't see why you couldn't, uh, assuming that the fund uh, itself was accredited. Uh, so either every equity holder of the fund is accredited or it has, I believe, over 5 million in assets. Um, but if it was not an, if, if the fund itself could not be considered an accredited investor, I wouldn't think you'd be able to raise from that. And looks like the final questions, and I, I don't know, isn't the new definitions effective uh, December 8th of this year? Uh, I don't think they've set the and I could be wrong on that. I don't think they've set a sort of a firm date as to, to when this will be effective yet, because I think they're they're waiting on on comments uh, from the general public essentially, and then ultimately have to get it, the uh, final legislation passed. And I think um, that's why it's probably closer to first quarter next year. And Kevin had it. One. No proposed changes to accredited investor definition, correct? Uh, so there, there were some tweaks uh, a couple of months ago, Jeff, that you're probably aware of that I think from in your world and in our world, ultimately are gonna change very little. Um, so uh, no, nothing nothing forthcoming uh, that, that we're seeing. And Kev, I think Kevin, you had a clarification can I become a tier two funder outside my own fund of funds that I manage? Or can I leverage the same relationships I make in my entity to use it outside as an independent finder? A tier two finder outside my own fund of funds. Yeah, I don't see why you could. I, I think you know any relationship you have, you could you could leverage as a as an independent finder. I don't think there's any sort of requirement on the nature of the relationship. And yes, uh, we'll get a recording of this video um, that will be sent out tomorrow, also with the PowerPoint. Roxy, if you're still on, you can confirm, but I believe that's the plan. And I don't believe it is. I don't believe it, it has been published in the Federal Register. I, register, I, I believe it's just a, a, a notice of a proposed order at this point. Right. I believe that concludes the questions. So thank you everybody that's still on for being here. Uh, regarding the video, we will send a link to everyone that's registered with, for the video tomorrow. Uh, as far as previous videos, uh, we have a YouTube channel uh, that you are encouraged to subscribe to. It has all of our past webinars uh, and more information on there. So look for Callister Law uh, on uh, YouTube and subscribe to that and you'll have access to all of the previous content. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Everyone everybody. have a good evening. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll also include a copy of the uh, contact information from the chat. Uh, I know you can't save it, but we'll, we'll provide that tomorrow as well. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.